Okay, hi everyone. My name is Jess Roman, and on behalf of the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium, I would like to welcome you to today's talk. Um, before we get started, if you're new to the Berlin Epi Methods Colloquium, welcome. We're here the first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. Uh, with interesting methods focused speakers from all sorts of sub disciplines in epidemiology. And we have a really exciting schedule for 2021 planned. We actually have it now complete. You can check that out anytime on our website, bemcolloquium.com. We also do a monthly journal club on the third Wednesday of the month at the same time. So you're always welcome to join our events. Today, I am really pleased to welcome Sabina Gablisch. Professor Gablisch is a professor both at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, where she runs the Research Department on Climate Resilience, if I've got that correct. And she's also a professor at the Charité um, for Climate Change and Health. So we're very, very um, eager to have her speak to us today about her work. And I'm sure a lot of design and methodological components of the farm study. So she'll tell you all about it. It's the Food and Agricultural Approaches to Reducing Malnutrition Study in Bangladesh. For this work, she won the prize for Courageous Science or Bold Research, if I'm translating that correctly, which I think is a really cool prize to, to win. So we're very happy that she's agreed to speak to us here today. Just a few logistical points before we get started. We have a Q&A feature on this webinar. So at any time, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A. And I'll keep my eye on those and I'll um, save them for the discussion. You can also upvote questions that other people have submitted in the Q&A. Um, on top of that, we have a chat. So if you have any issues, you can also write us in the chat with the webinar. We are recording this talk and we will um, stop the recording after Sabina's finished with her talk so we can have a bit more lively discussion round. So if you'd like to actually ask your question yourself, that kind of makes the round a bit more fun. You can just raise your hand. There's a button at the bottom of the screen, looks like this. You can raise your hand to ask the question yourself. And we've also invited some panelists. So with me here today, we have co-organizer Toivo Glatz of the BEMC, Chisato Ito, and we've invited Anya Colazzo. We've invited Kiva Kaule and Jillian Wade. We'll let them introduce themselves um, after the talk before we start the discussion round. I think I've covered everything except to remind you that our July talk uh, will be on July 7th and the topic is current methodological challenges in the study of sex and gender in health research by another Sabina, that's Sabina Urtheld Prigioni, and we'd be really happy if you can join that, us for that talk before the summer break. I think that's everything. So Sabina, um, welcome again. And if you could share your screen and you can start whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot, everyone. And thanks for joining us, Sabina. Thank you so much um, for the nice introduction, Jess. Just to clarify, there's only one professorship <laughs> department head at, at PIC, and, and then the professorship is linked to Charité. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the FARM study as a cluster randomized controlled field trial in practice. And um, after a bit of background to explain the motivation for the study, I will tell you more about its aims and the design, the data we collected, and then a few findings, and then also various add-on studies to the trial. So in our diets, we need macronutrients, namely carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and micronutrients. And the micronutrients comprise minerals such as zinc and iron and all the different vitamins. Globally, 800 million people suffer from hunger, meaning a lack of calories, and around 2 billion from micronutrient deficiencies, which is also referred to as hidden hunger. And because micronutrient needs are highest during growth, um, pregnant women and young children are particularly vulnerable. And for context, worldwide, an estimated 2 billion people are also overweight. Compared to a healthy child here on the left, acute undernutrition with macronutrients leads to wasting, meaning the child is too thin for their height. And this is kind of obvious and easy to see. And chronic undernutrition leads to stunting, meaning the child is too short for their age. And that's less obvious as you need to know the age. 
And of course, there's a population distribution. Some children are naturally shorter, others taller. Um, so this blue curve here shows the normal distribution of height for age in a healthy population. So it's like converted into a z-score. And the mean is zero, and the 95% of children are between minus two and plus two. Um, and minus two is um, the cutoff for stunting. And in the healthy uh, population, less than 3% of children are below that cutoff. And this red curve here is from Silet, Bangladesh. And you can see that the whole curve is shifted to the left, and meaning all the children are actually shorter than they should be. And the peak is actually here at minus two, meaning that half of the children are below the cutoff and therefore clearly too short for their age or stunted. And it's also important to know that healthy children grow on the same growth curves until age five all over the world. So any differences between, say, the Dutch and the Portuguese that they manifest later in, um, in life. So undernutrition is the underlying cause of almost half of all childhood deaths. And the deaths are just the tip of the iceberg. Undernutrition not only leads to stunted physical growth, but also compromises the functioning of the immune system and increases susceptibility to infections such as diarrhea, which again in a vicious circle leads to malabsorption of nutrients in the gut and more undernutrition. Undernutrition in early life also impacts on brain development, preventing children to reach their full potential in life. The first 1,000 days of life, um, that is counting from conception to about the second birthday, they are particularly vulnerable period where the damage done to the developing body and brain is often irreversible. So stunting already starts before birth. Many babies are already born too small due to growth restriction in utero. Now, in terms of solutions for undernutrition, the focus has so far been on so-called nutrition uh, specific interventions that tackle the direct causes. These are shown on the left. And while everybody agrees that these measures are important, their scope is limited because they do not address the underlying causes for undernutrition, such as limited food production or infections. And so-called nutrition sensitive interventions in other sectors, um, like agriculture and so on, are needed to tackle these root causes. In Bangladesh, undernutrition is highly prevalent with 17% of women underweight and a third of children stunted nationally. And a large proportion of the Bangladeshi population are smallholder farmers. Land is quite limited given that Bangladesh is the most densely populated territorial country in the world. It's like double population of Germany on far less than half the size. And with most of the country being at sea level, it's also highly vulnerable to climate change. Despite these challenges, Bangladesh has succeeded in becoming self-sufficient in rice, the main staple crop, but production of fruit and vegetables is not sufficient to fulfill, to fulfill needs. And in Bangladesh as South Asia in general, there's a social structure in which young women have a rather weak position. And they have been very successful with family planning and count only about 2.1 children born per woman um, nowadays. So this is not an uncommon dish in Bangladesh, mostly rice, very little sauce with lentils, vegetables, and a bit of fish. And there are several possible solution strategies for malnutrition. One, um, one can provide micronutrient supplements to sprinkle over the rice or breed vitamin A into the rice using genetic engineering. Or one could help people actually produce and eat more vegetables, fruit, and animal source foods and ensure a diverse diet of women and children. This second approach, this food-based approach is more complex, but also more sustainable. Um, so far funding mainly went to uh, the one dimensional solutions, which is partly due to a lack of evidence for these food-based approaches. Various uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs have long been doing nutrition sensitive projects, including Helen Keller International, HKI. And in their homestead food production, a program HKI works with local NGOs in Bangladesh to help women farmers establish year-round gardens 
uh, with one woman being the model farmer and in her garden they do the trainings and grow seeds. And besides fruits and vegetables, women also get help in poultry rearing for the eggs and occasional meat. And they also get marketing training so they can sell any surplus produce and earn some own income. And there are second, uh, regular courtyard sessions on how to eat during pregnancy, on young child feeding, with joint cooking sessions, as well as education on hygiene and health care. Now, although this approach is very promising from a theoretical viewpoint, the scientific evidence has been weak. There is some evidence that home gardening programs can increase vegetable production and improve dietary diversity and that they can empower women. However, it is not clear whether they can reduce stunting in children and improve health. And this was according to several systematic reviews, which highlighted that studies in this field were often too small or they, so they didn't have enough statistical power or they were too short term because it actually takes quite a while until a garden is fully productive or they didn't have rigorous uh, methodology with a control group. And of course, it's not easy to conduct studies on a complex agriculture, nutrition and health intervention and absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence of an effect. So what are we doing? Um, well, to fill this gap, I set out to do a study that is called um, Reducing Young Child Undernutrition through an integrated agricultural project with women's groups, a cluster randomized trial in rural Bangladesh. Um, that's the full name and is very descriptive. And I'll go through those aspects now. But actually, this name was a little bit long, and then we shrank it to food and agricultural approaches to reduce malnutrition, also to have a nice acronym, FARM. The idea came from a previous doctoral student who also designed this beautiful logo. Um, so the intervention we are evaluating in FARM is HKI's Homestead Food Production Program as implemented in Bangladesh. And it's a complex intervention, as I said, with several components and that should work synergistically. So there's a home gardening and the poultry rearing to produce nutritious food. The nutrition education is important to ensure that these foods are eaten by women and young children starting at the right age. And hygiene promotion is important to reduce infections. Um, then there's a the marketing, etc. And the aim with FARM is to provide scientific evidence that a complex homestead food production program with women's groups over these first 1,000 days of their children's lives can improve nutrition um, in women and children, reduce infections, and lead to better growth and development of the children. The primary outcome is stunting, or more specifically, length or height for HZ score. This is the list of outcomes studied. So beside the anthropometry, we're also looking at anemia, iron, vitamin A, and zinc deficiency, not only in the children, but also the women. And we study size at birth. And as part of the pathway assessment, we also measure dietary diversity and diarrhea prevalence. This is our simplified conceptual framework. We also have a very detailed one with all the specific indicators. And here on the top, there's these blue boxes. These are the components of the complex homestead, homestead food production intervention, the gardening, nutrition, education, et cetera. And these are hoped to influence the green boxes, food availability and income and hygiene behavior and care seeking with women's empowerment interacting with these. Then we have dietary intake and infections as the two major pathways towards child undernutrition. Uh, plus maternal undernutrition, which leads to intrauterine growth retardation and the child being stunted already at birth. And we've established a monitoring and surveillance system to measure indicators along all these pathways. So the idea is not to know not only if the intervention worked as some kind of black box, but also how exactly and why it failed um, if, where, if it didn't work. So coming to the setting within Bangladesh, we're working in select division where undernutrition indicators are amongst the worst in the country. Um, and more specifically, we're, the study area comprises 13 unions of Banai Chong and Nabigonj subdistricts. And we identified 96 geographic clusters or settlements, which are approximately villages in that area, which are shown as dots on this map here. 
To give you an idea of the study area, here's some pictures. There's a lot of rice fields and a lot of water bodies. And these pictures are actually from the dry season in March. Um, it's quite a challenging area as it experiences regular flooding. The lowlands where they grow rice during the dry season, they are largely underwater during the rainy season. Then only the villages, which are on some little hills, and some elevated footpaths are actually remain dry and stick out of the water. And in some places, you need boats to get around. And some more pictures. And our field office um, was located in the sub-district capital, Nabigonj. These were our inclusion criteria. So the settlements had to be suitable for home gardening with sufficient land and not too close to each other to avoid spillover of the intervention. And then the women had to have some land near the house because women's mobility is rather restricted in this area. And we included young married women as we were interested, of course, in looking at their children under age three for the primary outcome. Um, so farms designed as the cluster randomized trial, including 2,700 women in 96 settlements, um, shown again here. And after the baseline survey in 2015, we then randomized these into 48 intervention villages that received the Homestead Food Production Program and 48 controls. And the end line survey was done four years later, end of 2019, to compare nutrition between intervention and control in the same women as at baseline and their children then under three years of age. Also a bit of technical thing here, so when the number of units to be randomized is not very high, it's a good idea to use a restricted randomization method to ensure balance. And since we had baseline data available, um, covariate constraint randomization was our method of choice. And the software tools that were available in R and SAS couldn't handle our number of clusters. So we programmed our own solution in Stata, which we then made available as a user-friendly add-on command called CC Run. So basically the procedure first simulates all possible allocations of these number of units, um, in our case, the 96 villages, and these are many, many millions. And then it calculates differences of important covariates, for example, education or land size, and between the arms for each of them, uh, of each of these allocations. And then it discards all those that are not balanced. And then finally, one draws an allocation at random from the acceptable set. Now moving to the implementation. So this picture shows some of us with the implementation team in front of the HKI field office in Nabigonj. Three of the staff were experts from HKI in horticulture, nutrition, and poultry rearing. And they trained eight field facilitators from the local partner NGO who were based in the unions and conducted the gardening and nutrition trainings in the 48 intervention villages, each of them responsible for about 150 households. And here's some pictures of a field facilitator training the women and their families in the villages. These are pictures from the gardens. The families get seeds and material, and the trainings include composting and integrated pest control. And this shows some traditional chicken sheds on the left and the improved chicken sheds on the right that were promoted. Um, they also promoted local chicken breeds because they're more resistant to disease and also vaccinators were trained in the villages for the chicken. Here's some proud gardeners harvesting a gourd and some chicks. Yeah, and we realized quite early on that the hygiene pathway um, was a little bit neglected in the implementation compared to the nutrition aspect. And of course, it doesn't only matter what is fed to a child, but also whether this food is contaminated with bacteria, which grow quite easily in a tropical climate without fridges. And if a child has infection in the gut or even just pathogenic bacteria, then all the nice micronutrients it may have eaten will not necessarily get absorbed. And the immune system reaction to the bacteria will also use up a lot of energy. So we added on a module to strengthen the food hygiene component. And we also used that to reinforce the uh, food related messages that was done in 2017 with additional staff. Um, we recruited locally, there was like, um, these eight women that did that intervention aspect. And um, this was the slogan, safe, nutritious food, ideal family, and the six 
behaviors that were promoted, it's like wash hands with soap and water, but these are also the two nutrition ones. Um, hygiene behavior is obviously hard to change, and our behavior change approach was based on an intervention in Nepal that we adapted to Bangladesh, less intense and costly and at a 10 times larger scale. It builds on emotional drivers such as pride, nurture, and disgust, and engaging group activities such as role plays and glow jam on your hands and also physical changes in the kitchen to make the new behaviors easier. And also their individual counseling at home. And also there were fun competitions where people could win prizes for the King Kitchen competition and the ideal family competition. So this whole um, thing emerged into a new DFG project called Feed for Food Hygiene and Environmental Enteric Dysfunction. And that's in partnership with the Bangladeshi Research Institution, ICDDRB. So EED is a chronic inflammation in the gut due to constant intake of um, disease-causing bacteria, and it may hamper child growth even without any obvious diarrhea. So we're also looking at the gut microbiota and how pathogens and nutrition affect that. Here's the study timeline. Um, here's a baseline survey. The end line actually extended a bit in 2020, and we're currently now in the analysis phase. The project's still been extended, still running. So the intervention in orange uh, was delivered after the baseline survey, and then towards the end it was reduced and then stopped when the families should be able to continue by themselves. Outputs from the garden um, here in green show obviously a while to actually be in full swing. And here I put some examples for children eligible to be included at Endline. So those who were nearly three years at Endline, they were conceived in early 2016. Um, so that the children under age three that we measured at Endline were conceived and born during the trial, and they could have sort of already benefited in utero. And we recruited women under age 30, which are the most fertile age, but of course, not all women will have children over the trial period. So this means that in terms of sample size of children, this um, design is less eff efficient than trials that include pregnant women. But it's actually the only way this could have worked um, because the gardening takes quite some time until it takes effect, unlike a vitamin pill. So if we would, um, only, if we would train pregnant women, then these children would be born um, by the time that the gardens are finally productive and they wouldn't benefit during a large part of their first 1000 days, including this whole in utero period. Yeah, so what are the features of farm that make it more likely to um, uh, show an impact? So the trial duration is sufficiently long to allow time for training local NGOs and then the model farmers and then all the women. The sample size is relatively large and the design is very strong using an RCT with a large number of clusters. And the special feature of pharma that we recruited women before they actually got pregnant so that children can benefit from day zero. We also collected blood samples and can study impact on micronutrient deficiencies. And we collected a lot of information on the pathways to be able to tell how the intervention worked or why it failed. So now I'll tell you more about our data collection. Um, this is the overview, and I will say a little bit more about each of these um, five components, starting with the formative research. Our data collection was done with electronically losing tablets with ONA software, which worked really well for us. Uh, so one part of the formative research that was um, with an agriculture student and we sampled 64 households that already had gardens from six villages um, in this project area to understand what are actually current practices. And he identified a large number of species, fruit, vegetables and spices and set up a food plant inventory. And it showed up that few gardens were very rich in species and numbers, while most gardens actually had few plants and were only active during few months in the year. The most commonly reported problems in the gardens were pests and low soil fertility. And the contribution of these gardens to the family food was rather modest, so there was clearly room for improvement. 
from March to May 2015, we completed the farm baseline survey, interviewing over 2,600 women in all 96 villages. So we collected information on the woman and her child, on feeding practices, diseases, healthcare seeking, on household assets and agriculture. And we measured height, weight, and head circumference and took capillary blood samples uh, of women and children. Hemoglobin was measured directly in the field um, with HemoCube, and we also froze some blood samples for later micronutrient analysis. This is the baseline survey team, including also HKI and Heidelberg staff, around 70 people. And these pictures were taken during the training. Here you see the, the weight measurement with the mother and child scale and the length board. Um, blood sampling was done with the finger prick. You can see that here. And uh, this is the HemoQ machine for measuring hemoglobin immediately. And as a reward, the children got a finger puppet made by a um, fair trade company in Dhaka to make them happy again. And during the end line survey, we didn't do finger prick. We actually did venous blood so that we had more volume for different analysis. These are the teams leaving to the field in the morning. So miraculously, the whole anthropometry blood sampling team of four people and their equipment fitted one of these uh, CNG three wheelers, which is a good thing because these CNGs could get really close to the villages on the small footpaths. So we accompanied the program implementation with intense monitoring and evaluation activities. So um, one thing is that the local NGO staff received smartphones to monitor their training activities. So which women and families actually attended the training, which topics were covered, which assets distributed, et cetera. And, and on a rolling basis, they also completed questionnaires with the women and the households on how the garden crops were growing, the chicken laying eggs, and women improving their knowledge. In addition, we also had process evaluation activities through qualitative researchers at Brock University to learn about program dynamics. Ah, what was that? Yeah. Um, and through our monitoring system and also discussions with the field staff, we could identify and solve various implementation issues. So to improve the soil fertility, we taught farmers to produce fertilizer from cow urine and biochar, and I'll mention that in a bit more detail later. And there have been several flooding events at unusual times, and we introduced sack gardens in response. Um, Zeleti so, so society is very conservative with very low mobility of women and also difficulties of women in assuming a leadership role, unlike in other parts of Bangladesh. And therefore, um, the strategy was slightly changed and whole families were made model farmers and did trainings. And also the trainings were done in smaller groups so that they were closer to the home and the women didn't have to go that far. Then out of these seven field facilitators from the local NGOs that were initially hired and then trained by HKI, six left within the first year, which was a serious problem. And then we identified several reasons, including that other projects in the area were paying more. So we increased the salaries and we also hired one more field facilitator to help reduce the workload. And, and also we helped the NGO to improve the counseling to focus more on the quality um, of the counseling to really cover all the topics the nutrition and the gardening and everything, rather than rushing through to get um, through with all the families on a tight schedule. We also did several quizzes um, where prizes could be won to ensure that the field facilitators had the necessary knowledge. Mm. So while this process evaluation that I just talked about is, was, that was obviously only intervention group, the farm surveillance system covered all households, intervention and control. So every two months, we gathered information on last menstrual period and pregnancies, on dietary diversity and child diarrhea, and also every season on the garden crops and occasionally on other items such as a depression score for a doctoral thesis. In a subsample of households, uh, we did a 24 hour dietary recall of the whole family to get more detailed information on nutrient adequacy and intra household distribution of foods. And we established a birth surveillance 
system to try and visit all newborn babies within three days of birth to measure them. This is a picture from a routine surveillance visit. Here you see the tablet with which the data collection was done, but there's also some paper lists on who they should go and visit. This is a team of young local women that um, did the surveillance visits as a training meeting with HKI's um, monitoring evaluation expert. So for these newborn visits, it turned out not that easy to measure all the babies within three days because most births are at home in this setting and some women travel to their parents' house to give birth. So we set up um, a, a calling system um, to call women by mobile phone to remind them that they call us when the baby comes and we gave them phone credit and some small presents as an incentive. And eventually we then managed to visit nearly 90% of babies within 72 hours and 80% within 24 hours. Um, in addition for the food hygiene project, we collected stool samples from children and aliquoted did them in the field lab for a later analysis of microbes and inflammation. And in a hot climate with no fridges, the logistics of stool sampling in villages was quite a challenge, but we found some good solutions involving the women themselves. Then in September 2019, we started the end line survey. We set up a laboratory in the field office to a centrifuge and aliquot the venous blood samples. And we also rented a complete blood count machine um, we hired and trained a small lab team overseen by our partner organization, ICDDRB, and then we hired and trained field staff to do the anthropometry, the blood sampling, and the questionnaires. It was around 60 people total without the researchers. And here's a selfie of the core research team on the bus to Nabigonj. On the left, you see Benny puncture practice with a rubber arm, and here's some child height measurement training on the right. This is this complete blood, blood count machine, which at some point I did not believe was going to arrive ever. We had to be very persistent with that company. Um, this is the field lab setup. Yeah, this is a logistics thing. So we always gave the women some small incentive for their time when we did interviews and stuff, like a bowl or a mug or something. And for end line, we decided on a type of pot, which was rather large. And then we ordered too many at once. So in the beginning, there was hardly any space in the field offices anymore. The target for the endline survey was our 2,700 women and um, their children. And we got 94% of the women for anthropometry and 92% for blood. And in the end, we had a special team actually that traveled even to other towns for doing the interviews and the anthropometry, not, not for the blood. And some women had moved away to quite distant locations, even abroad, so we didn't have a chance to catch them all. In the, for the child blood samples in the beginning, we had very low completion. And then we investigated this and we found there were both technical issues with venipuncture and also apparent refusals. And then we could solve some of these technical issues. And then we learned that the field staff didn't fully realize that it was important to get these blood samples from the children. And also they thought that if they worked slower then they would get hired for longer. So we explained things to them and we also set up um, a team of the week competition. So giving special mention every week to the best of the five teams, one mention for quantity, but also one for quality and effort to not just trade that off. And it sparked such a sport spirit and enthusiasm that we were all amazed and the numbers went up and up. And then the lab got overwhelmed with too many samples and they had to work until late in the night and we had another emergency meeting and we sent then some teams to very difficult or far away villages and um, so that they were slowed down a little bit. And in the end, we, we managed that all and we got quite a good completion also for the child blood samples. Then for the women's survey and the household survey, we also got a good completion. And the last two modules, they went into the field a bit later because it kind of the questionnaire became a bit too long. So we moved them out to not overwhelm people. And then they were cut short by the corona lockdown last year in spring. Okay, now showing a few results, but I'll keep this short as the focus is kind of more on the methods. And we're also still busy um, analyzing the primary outcome actually. 
a bit stuff from baseline to describe our study population. So in our site, the Hindu minority makes up 31%. The women were on average 25 years old at baseline and got married at 18. 17% um, never went to school and another 21% did not complete primary school. The average height of our participant, participant women is 150.6 centimeters. Um, the shortest woman was one meter 34 and the tallest one meter 70. Um, the women's BMI ranged um, from 14 to 33 with a mean of 20. Oops, here we have it. Um, and one third of women was actually below the cutoff for underweight, which is 18.5. But there are also a few overweight women and some obese, as you see here. This histogram shows the distribution of the length for age uh, Z scores in the children under age three at baseline. So 41% of the children were below the cutoff of minus two and considered stunted. And um, this is kind of where the mean should be in the healthy child population. For assessing dietary diversity, these are the food groups according to current guidelines, 10 for women and seven for children. Um, dietary diversity was poor in both women and young children at baseline. Only about a third, um, shown in green here, ate the minimum number of food groups indicating an adequate diet. And this is part of our baseline table that shows that we achieved good balance between intervention and control arms. The number of vegetable species grown in the gardens increased in the intervention group already in the very first season. We looked and then it stayed clearly higher throughout, about double, there were about six to seven species in the intervention with the three in the control group. There was also an increase in fruit species grown with no, lower numbers overall. Now this shows the percentage of women with adequate dietary diversity, um, eating at least five out of 10 fruit groups on the previous day. And there was no difference at baseline. And then from late 2016 onwards, um, it showed a statistically significant, statistically significant improvement. And at end line, 59% of intervention women had adequate dietary diversity compared to 45% of controls. If you look at mean food groups consumed, this was an increase of about half a food group more in the intervention group. And these are the food groups where we saw any improvements. Um, this is showing adequate dietary diversity in the children over time. And we see a consistent improvement over control from 2017 onwards, approximately. And the food groups that improved in the children were vitamin A rich foods, eggs, and dairy products. Um, here's some early results from the food hygiene study of the food samples ready to feed to a young child. Nearly half were contaminated with E. coli, more than a quarter highly contaminated. And the foods that were served with clean utensils were less contaminated and also freshly prepared foods. Um, and yeah, we're looking at further things on the pathogens, enteric inflammation, and microbiota now. Yeah, moving to the last chapter. Um, so we added various add-on studies from different disciplines. The food hygiene project kind of nearly integrated into farm, I already mentioned. And we kind of used the main trial as a starting point and then tried to make this more comprehensive and interdisciplinary. And also some were done to solve problems that we encountered. So one add-on was related to the home gardening aspect. I already mentioned it briefly. Um, it's the biochar project. So as I said in the beginning, there was low soil fertility was a complaint by the farmers in our formative research. And we added this uh, project to improve the soil fertility in a sustainable way. Okay, so what is biochar? Biochar is it's a bit like a charcoal. It's created through exposing biomass to temperatures above 400 degrees in an oxygen limited environment. And it's a light and porous material with a huge inner surface like a sponge here, you can see that. And it can hold nutrients and water. And uh, urine is known to be an excellent and highly efficient fertilizer, and it's available for free, unlike mineral fertilizer, which is expensive for small scale farmers. However, urine is underused in many settings because of the smell and associated sociocultural barriers. Biochar can soak up urine and transform it into an odorless solid fertilizer. 
And with a new low-tech method um, that I'm going to show you in the next slide, biojar can be produced in soil pit kilns at village level from crop waste like rice straw. And there's been a bit of a hype around biochar in recent years, as it's also a method to put carbon back into the soil and reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and it's maybe not the solution to all of this, but it's been shown to work very well for small scale farmers in Nepal. And we tested this technology with our gardeners in Bangladesh to help improve the soil fertility at low cost. And first we did a feasibility study and we found that human urine was not culturally acceptable. That was yuck, but cow urine was totally fine as people also use the cow dung on a daily basis. Um, now these are the production steps, which can be completed in half a day from collecting the biomass and digging the hole and then pyrolyzing it, dousing the fire and then mixing it with urine before applying in the garden. So we did this qualitative acceptability study and I found also that farmers really liked the method for a range of reasons. And we set up field trials of different crops fertilized with that urine biochar mixtures, sometimes also compost in it. And then the farmers kind of used this new method and compared it with their usual method alongside so they could see for themselves. And the yields increased quite impressively with about 60% higher than in the control plots. Here are some concrete numbers of what that means for cabbage and kohlrabi yields. Then we got funding to scale this up to all of our intervention villages. And when we asked in our routine surveillance, nearly half of the farmers continued to use this biochar based fertilizer months after the close of that intervention. And we've published a paper on this. If someone's interested to look it up, I'll share the slides. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this area experiences seasonal flooding, which is normal. But in 2017, the monsoon came two months early and destroyed the rice harvest of many households because the rice was still green when the water came and then it rotted. And then we investigated the consequences on food security and diets as we were kind of already measuring those. So in addition, we asked people how badly they were affected and also how they coped with that. Over half um, were affected to a great extent shown in red here and a fifth was not affected in green. And six months after the flood, among the families that were greatly affected, only 21% were food secure, while there was 39% in the others. And more than half of those who were greatly affected borrowed money, mostly from outside lenders with high interest rates. Um, yeah, and we're now looking also in the longer term consequences of that. Um, women's empowerment is also quite an important aspect in our impact pathway, and we had an add-on study on that aspect. And that was part of the Gender, Agriculture, and Assets Project Phase 2, GAP2, funded by IFPRI. And this was a consortium of 13 projects across Africa and South Asia to pilot test and provide feedback on the development of the project-level women's empowerment in agriculture index, the PROVIA. So we evaluated the impact of the farm interventions on women's agency using this tool about four months after the intervention had ended. And we found overall higher agency among intervention women in several aspects, largely driven by improvements in intrinsic and collective agency. In particular, we saw greater self-efficacy and more women finding partner violence unacceptable, increased asset ownership and control over income, as well as more group membership and greater membership in groups that were considered influential. This shows the distribution of respondents who achieved empowerment on a number of indicators and the cutoff used. And women in the farm intervention group shown in purple here um, had levels of agency similar to the men shown in blue and much higher than the women in the control group shown in pink which corresponds to better gender equity in our intervention areas. Now, these are two studies piggybacking on farm, which are dealing with prenatal environmental exposures. We already measured the pregnancies and babies at birth because we wanted to see the impact of the main intervention during the in utero period. So the outcomes are kind of provided by the main trial. And then arsenic in groundwater is a huge problem in Bangladesh. It's known that arsenic causes cancer. 
And we want to now investigate its impact in the prenatal period as we are already looking at the birth outcomes. And for that, we took water samples from all the tube wells used by our participants um, in collaboration with colleagues in geology and geography in Heidelberg who are, they are interested in how does the arsenic get into the groundwater and, and also um, on filter systems, how we can get rid of it. Mycotoxins are toxins produced by mold. Usually it's not as visible as on this piece of bread and they're common in tropical climates. And mycotoxins can negatively impact growth and development in utero, which is a question that Nick investigates as part of his doctoral thesis. Yeah, this, is, um, this study is called MEMAPO for maternal exposures to mycotoxins and adverse pregnancy outcomes. And we took urine samples from pregnant women over the last years of the trial to analyze them for micronutrient, mycotoxins, sorry. And this shows the aliquotation of the urine in our field lab. Yeah, and then there are further add-on studies. Um, Amanda investigates the causes of anemia and she found that iron is not the main issue in the area. And here this tube well study also helped because we found that there's actually a lot of iron in the tube well water, um, which can explain part of that. And then she's looking into other causes of anemia such as thalassemia. And one doctoral thesis that has been completed was on the link between nutrition and peripartum depression. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details now, but before I end this talk, I wanna say something about the special challenges we faced also while doing a trial in this setting. So two new security problems emerged during the trial. First, there was a political fight, which led to a transport blockade where Molotov cocktails were thrown into vehicles and rail tracks removed. And that was just when we wanted to start our baseline survey. Then later on, several foreigners were shot purposefully. And a year later, a larger group of foreigners were killed cruelly in an attack on a restaurant in Dhaka claimed by um, IS. And the heightened security measures made it a lot more difficult for the foreigners on the team to work and stay in the field for longer amounts of time. Um, then not as dramatic, but equally harmful were slow bureaucracies, including customs and ethics approvals, which delayed things for many months. And now the newest problem is of course the coronavirus shutdown, but luckily we're nearly done. And then there were also some other types of challenges. So electricity is not reliable in our field site, which is a real problem in a survey using electronic data collection and also centrifuging in the lab and storing samples in freezers. So eventually we had an auto generator, a backup generator and various power bars. Internet was also a constant struggle also to upload the new questionnaires for the survey team. And, and then before end line, then we finally managed to get Wi-Fi, which was a big relief. And then last but not least, some spiders there are rather large and those with spider phobia on the team um, needed someone to catch them and, with a bucket and put them outside. And I will now show a picture of a spider. So look away if you don't want to see it. So here for comparison, a, a small spider. You needed a bucket. <laughs> Um, so to conclude, FARM is an example for a complex intervention, a sustainable solution against malnutrition that can contribute to climate change adaptation and increased resilience, and how this can be evaluated with rigorous scientific methods using a trial, but also monitoring and process evaluation to understand the pathways and also do course corrective implementation. And it's an example of collaboration between several scientific disciplines and NGOs. Yeah, and finally, I want to thank our various collaborators and our funders, the main funder being the BMBF, um, funding the team and also the bulk of the intervention. Yeah, thank you so much. That was it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabina. This was really a, a really interesting presentation. And um, I would say we will uh, first stop the recording and then move into the discussion round. For, so for those of you tuning in later on, we'll say goodbye now. <laughs>